Turn to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew chapter 9. The book of Matthew chapter 9, beginning at 35, and we're going to read through 38. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. If you have it, say amen. amen. Oh, that was terrible. If you have it, say amen. amen. I, I know we're still tired from Thanksgiving and the turkey, and there were some folk who just could not get out of the bed this morning because of the turkey, but we all need your support and help this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 Matthew 9, 35, say amen. amen. There we go. Woo. Jesus went through all the towns and villages. Everybody say villages. villages. And villages, teaching in their synagogues. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease. I love that. Everybody say every disease. Every disease, every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the workers are few. Verse 38. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. God, I, I praise you for it. And God, I thank you that what's waiting in your word and what's going to come out of your word would be released to your people. Father, I ask for supernatural ability for your people to hear. I ask for supernatural receptivity of your people to hear and for a supernatural energy in life in this place to hit their lives, their minds, their souls and their bodies in this house to receive of you that we together might be changed by your spirit. For your glory and for our good, speak your word in this house, I pray. And anoint me, I ask, as always, to speak it for your glory and for their good. In the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. amen. And amen. Look at your neighbor and tell them, reaping your harvest, reaping your harvest. A, plentiful harvest. a plentiful harvest. And you may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Here we are on the last sermon of the series on reaping your harvest. And so we've been dealing with a planned harvest. A purpose harvest and a plentiful harvest. And so I pray that as this month has gone on, it's gone by, that you've received things of the Lord. You've received instruction from the Lord. You've received renewal from the Lord and a mandate from God for an understanding of who he is and what he wants to do in our lives. And so for the two messages on reaping the harvest that we've been preaching on this month, we've really been dealing with the harvest in that it will come to us. The blessing of God that comes to our life. The provision of God that comes to our life through a manner of many different ways. And as I was preparing for the last sermon in this series, I said, okay, God, what do you want to say? And how do you want to say it? And what's the verse? What's the text that you want for me to preach on Sunday? And so he took me to Matthew chapter 9. And I said, wow. I said, this is completely different than any of the harvest messages that we've been preaching on. Because as I said, it's been all about blessing and power and prosperity and abundance and the harvest is coming your way. So get ready for it. And so this particular scripture and this particular text is completely different than where we've been for the, for the month of November. But I feel it very strong and I feel very important that God wants to give you and he wants to give me a different type of message to close out this series. So look at your neighbor and say, this will be. A different, a different kind, kind of message. Let's read the last verse of the chapter. Ask the Lord of the harvest. So there's the word harvest. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest. There it is again, his harvest field. Now, what's going on in Matthew chapter 9? In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is moving in ministry. Jesus is moving in signs. He's moving in wonders. He's moving in deliverance. Out of his ministry is power. Out of his ministry is might. Out of his ministry is glory. And wherever he goes, signs and wonders and brilliance and glory takes place. And so as he begins to move in his ministry, the Bible tells us that Jesus, yes, is full of joy as, as Deacon Rich prayed this morning. Yes, Jesus is happy. Yes, Jesus is seeing the, the miraculous in his ministry. 
But at the same time, while Jesus is happy about it all, Jesus is discontented at the same time. Jesus has an issue. Jesus has a problem. Jesus has something plaguing his mind. He has something that's living on the inside of his soul that is bringing him a lack of rest. It's bringing him an inability to stay at peace because he's seeing something that he does not necessarily want to see. What is he seeing? He is seeing people. He's seeing individuals. He's seeing groups of people and the multitudes receive miracles, receive change, receive healing, receive signs, wonders, glory, manifestation of the kingdom, uh, the literal transformation of people's minds, receiving who he is, receiving what he does, receiving his identity. But at the same time, he's seeing thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who have no leader and who have no shepherd. And what caused his discontent, what caused his inability to be at peace and to be at rest in his ministry in that moment was this. He was seeing the effect of the non-effect of the religious leaders of his day. He's seeing people who said, you know what, I believe in at this time, I believe in the law of Moses. I believe in Judaism. I believe in the Hebraic rules and the Hebraic instruction. I believe in it all. But by the time you get to the time of Jesus, there are multitudes and there are thousands of people who are left without leadership in that certain religious sect. And Jesus looks at the multitudes and he looks at the thousands and he says, I cannot believe what I'm seeing. There are people all over the place who are receiving manifestation from the kingdom but they have no leader. And if they have no leader, then they don't know where they're going. There is a paradigm. There is a reality in this life. And it's this. Without leadership, there is no destination. Without a leader, there is no entering the promised land. Without a leader... Without a voice, without somebody who will stand and orate a specific message, you will only have a group of people who are wandering through the wilderness without a place to rest and without a place to go. And Jesus stands at this point and this place in his ministry and he looks around at all the people who are following him and thinks back to all of the people who were following John and he said, these people are looking for a leader. They are sheep like without a shepherd. They are followers looking for someone to guide them and to bring them into and to navigate them into something new. And Jesus looks at everybody and his heart begins to break and that breaking never left him until the culmination of all things and until the finality and the purpose of his arrival on earth. But as Jesus was moving through his ministry, that longing and that hurt and that pain to see the people of his day find a leader and find somebody who would carry him through lived on the inside of him. And the Bible says in the book of Matthew 23 and 37 that that feeling, that sentiment, that emotion was still there. For Jesus said this, he said, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I want to gather your children Children, as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings. There was always a longing. There was always a reality in the heart and the mind and the soul and the spirit of Jesus to see people not lost, to see them not confused, to see them not despondent, not knowing where they're going to go, but to see them attach themselves to a person and a leader to bring them into the fulfillment of the assignment that lived upon their life. That is something that lived in the mind and the heart of Jesus every day of his ministry, and it never left. Amen. It should be the heart and the soul and the drive of every person who calls himself a leader to see the people that are under them move into the place that they're supposed to go. To move into territory that their feet have never touched. Yeah. To hear words and messages that their ears have never heard before. Yeah. 
to see things in their mind's eye and in their spiritual eye to understand and receive a rhema from God that will literally transform them from the inside out and what's given to them can be shared to somebody else. That should be living in the heart of every leader or somebody who says, I stand in a place and in a position of taking people from where they are to bring them to the next place. That should be extant. That should be living in the mind and the body and the soul of every person who says that that's what they are. I know I'm preaching old school this morning. Jesus lives with that. He can't escape it. He can't let it go. It, it's, it's in his mind in the morning when he wakes up. It's in his mind in the afternoon when he's hanging out with the disciples. When he pillows his head at night to go to sleep, it's still in his mind. The life and the heart and the soul of every Jew of that day and the lack of leadership from the religious sect of that day was plain. And Jesus says this. He said, or the Bible says, excuse me, that he was perturbed, he was perplexed, he was bothered. And the Bible gives us an indicator specifically as to what it is that he felt and said. Let's look at 37. He said, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Jesus said there is a reality right now. The field, the harvest is ripe. There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who are living and residing in the harvest field. King James says, and the harvest, it, it's white under harvest. The fields are white under harvest. That there are people all over in this time frame. And they're living and they're existing and they're residing in a state of harvest where the harvest is ripe and it's ready to be reaped. But the problem is, is that the workers in the field are few. I want you to see it in your mind's eye. I want you to look past and I want you to look beyond the box that says ripping a harvest. And I want you to see all of the harvest grains and all of the stock. I want you to see that. And I want you to multiply that by thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands. I want you to see it in your mind right now. Because when you see it and when you understand it, then you're going to know and see what Jesus saw. And Jesus says, this field is plenty. This field is ripe. But the workers and the laborers are few. Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful. Everybody say plentiful. plentiful. That word plentiful there is the Greek word polis. P-O-L-Y-S. Polis. And it means great large, and so many. Jesus said, I'm speaking to you, disciples, in a metaphor. I'm giving you a picture of what's going on. Every person that you see, every person that you come across, they're a stock in the harvest. And each person that you come across, each person that you say hello to, each person that you have a conversation with, they are plentiful. There are so many of them. There's more than you think there are. They're polys. There's a great number of them. And Jesus knew that the harvest was so large and it was at the brink of being reaped. But as we know, the workers are few. The problem is this is that there was too much of a harvest for the little amount of workers. And Jesus' point of contention was that there are enough workers to go in the field 
and that harvest would not be brought into the kingdom. Was Jesus just upset because there was not enough workers? No. Was Jesus just upset because he had the 72 and he had the 12 disciples with him? No. The greater issue and the greater problem was that if there were no reapers in the harvest and if there were no workers in the harvest, then what was waiting in the harvest field would not make itself into the kingdom. And Jesus on the inside and Jesus heart and Jesus longing was all about souls. It was all about people. It was all about bringing somebody who didn't know who he was and didn't understand his identity, but was at the brink of understanding who he was so that they might get to the place where they can step over into understanding and find themselves living in the kingdom that Jesus brought to the earth. And Jesus says, my issue is this. We need to make sure that all of these souls, that all of these individuals understand who I am, understand that the kingdom is nigh, understand that the kingdom is ready, understand that the kingdom is there, and if they move from that place into another place, then they're going to move in the kingdom manifestation, kingdom demonstration, kingdom glory, kingdom power, kingdom might, kingdom brilliance, if they will simply move into the place where the harvest is reaped, and Jesus says, the workers are few, so we need more. There will always be the reality. There will always be the paradigm. There will always be the construct that the laborers are few and that the, that the harvest is much. That's right. That's right. Every single person in this world, every single person on this planet who does not know our God, who does not know our Christ, is a stalk of grain in the harvest field. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Every person who has never heard the name Jesus before mm-hmm. is that stalk of grain in the harvest field. Amen. Every person who has heard the message of Jesus but did not accept the message of Jesus is a stalk of grain in the harvest field. Every person wandering through this world and through their life and has not come to a place of understanding and destination in the kingdom of God is a stalk of grain in the harvest field. Just look at the numbers right now. Look at how small and little the church world has become and how great and grand and powerful the world has become. Can I get the door closed, please? It tells you and it tells me that the laborers are Paulus. The harvest is Paulus, excuse me. The laborers are few. And Jesus says this. He says, there is, everybody say there is. There is a solution to this problem. You see, you see, you see that's what I love about Jesus. Because Jesus didn't just preach the problem. Jesus preached the solution to the problem. Somebody put that on your refrigerator uh, tonight. Don't rehearse the problem. Rehearse the solution. (laughs) Let, let Let me just be frank and bold right now. The Lord is done hearing about the problem. Some of us have rehearsed our problem 16,000 times over. And God is saying, I saw the problem before it happened. I saw the problem when it happened. And I've heard the rehearsal of the problem for the past 10 years. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to stop rehearsing the problem and start preaching the solution. And so Jesus moves from discontentedness He moves from a lack of peace. 
he moves from being bothered and he transitions into solution. And the solution is this, ask. Where do you find now? Verse 38. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Verse 38, ask. Where's the solution? 38, ask. Where's the fix? Ask. Where's the culmination and, and where's the settling of the problem? Ask. He said, ask who? Ask the Lord of the harvest. There is a harvest, but the harvest is not unsupervised. There is a harvest, but the harvest is not seen. There is a harvest, but there's somebody who's standing watching over the harvest. And Jesus says, ask the Lord of the harvest to do something with the harvest. He's preaching, he's declaring a paradigm and a dynamic and says the harvest that you see and all of the stocks in the field and all of the stocks in the harvest field are seen by God. There's somebody who's watching. There's somebody who's in control. This is not a harvest field that is not seen by God. This is not a harvest field that is not looked upon by God or unsupervised by God. No, Jesus says, there is the reality. God, my father, is watching over the harvest field, know where it's at, knows the status of it all and has a plan for it all and Jesus says and so now I'm going to give you the solution to this issue ask the Lord of the harvest and so the word ask there is the Greek word deomai d-e-o-m-a-i deomai it means to pray to implore and to plead with ask the Lord of the harvest. Move into a place where you begin to ask of him for your need. Move into the place where you begin to open your mouth and hit the spot and hit the issue of contention here. Move into the place where you're not living in a state of silence anymore, but you stay talking to God, speaking to God, imploring God, asking God to do something with the harvest that he's supervising. If Jesus knew that God did not have a supervisory eye over the harvest, then he would have never told his disciples to start asking the Lord of the harvest to do something with the harvest. But Jesus says, if you'll simply move into asking, if you'll move into praying, if you'll move into imploring, the God of the harvest, then the God of the harvest, who's responsible for the harvest, will start doing something with the harvest, and he will start making a change with the harvest field that he's standing over. And Jesus says, so disciples, it's time to move into asking. The days of silence are over. The time of being lazy is over. The time of keeping your mouth shut is over. Start asking the Lord of the harvest, and the Lord of the harvest will start doing something with the field that he's watching over. Start asking him and start asking him now ask the Lord of the harvest to what to send out now this phrase send out is very 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 interesting Because send out doesn't simply mean to move somebody to something. It doesn't simply mean to kind of say, hey, I got a nice suggestion for you. Why don't you go to the harvest field and start working in the harvest with people? The phrase send out is the Greek word for those who are interested, ekbalo, E-K-B-A-L-L-O. And it means this, to bring, to pluck out, and to send away. To bring, to pluck out, and to send away. What does that mean? In order for something to be brought, in order for something to be sent out, 
In order for something to be plucked out, that means that there must be a transfer of one location into another. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send people to pluck them out, to send them out from where they are and move them into the field of harvest. Yes, yes Lord. Yes, Lord. 30% are getting yes, it. Lord. See it. Yes. See it. Yes. To pluck out, yes. to send away from where somebody is residing and living to transfer them and to transition them from where they are in their current state and transport them into the field of harvest. Anybody ever seen Star Trek? When they stand in that little space and he would say what? Beam me up, Scotty. (laughs) He should have said it like a preacher. He said, beam me up, Scotty. He said, beam me up, Scotty. (laughs) And all of a sudden, Captain Kirk and Spock and all the rest of them would leave where they were and disappear. And all of a sudden, they'd be in a new land. In essence... That is what happens when you ask the Lord of the harvest to send out, to pluck out, to send away, to bring to somebody who's living in a place and send them into the harvest. Somebody starts needing to pray the prayer. Send them out, pluck them out, beam them up and beam them into because there are people who are living in their homes. There are people who are living in their land. There are people living in their own life and their own territory and they are praying nothing and the church is praying nothing and people stand in one place and they never get sent, plucked out, taken out from where they are, and they're never moved to the harvest field because there are people all over the world who are not praying to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the field. And if people do not pray the prayer, there will be a harvest that has never been reaped. There are so many things. There are so many entities. There are so many realities that live and that plague the heart and the mind and the lives of men and women today. There are so many distractions. There are so many distractors. There are so many modes of operation and modes of thinking and ways of thinking that people have allowed to be the blueprint for their life. And what is of the kingdom and what comes from the kingdom and the priorities of the kingdom and the will of the kingdom and the dynamic and identity of the kingdom never comes to manifestation in somebody's life because everything else takes precedence and focus. Parties take focus, Pro, uh, sports takes focus, your own lives take focus, money takes the focus, a career takes the focus, people's families take the focus, people's own idiosyncratic understanding and behavior of who they are and what they feel about themselves and how they've been trying to maneuver their life in a certain way to make, them live, to make their lives okay and make it work, which takes precedence and priority over the kingdom, becomes the focus. And what happens? The laborers are few, but the harvest is many. And Jesus tells you, and he tells me, switch your priority. Switch your understanding. 
begin to shift your mind and get it on the responsibilities of the kingdom. Your money doesn't matter. Your status doesn't matter. Your own will doesn't matter. What you feel about what you want in your life for the next 10 years of your life, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the kingdom of God. The only thing that matters is the harvest field. The only thing that matters is souls, 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 souls. And as the old revivalist said, let us have souls lest we die. The kingdom of God has to be number one in the life of every Christian, in the life of every person who says Jesus is my Lord and my Savior and his will has to become mine and nothing less. When the priority of the kingdom becomes the priority of people, then the laborers become many. If people will move from and stop worrying about pleasing themselves, pleasing their families, pleasing their own desires, pleasing their own wants, satisfying their own will and what lies in the hearts of their minds and their spirits. If they will move from there into there, then the workers become many while the field is much. But there will always be less to change takes place. The reality and the truth that if the laborers stay few and the harvest stays much, that this harvest that you see by multiplied thousands upon thousands will never be reaped. The sick will never be moved. And those souls will never be brought into the kingdom. And the stalk of grain that was once ripe will now die lifeless on the same field that it was supposed to receive its reaping in. And so there is this morning a call of God to your life and to my life. And to everyone who's watching on Facebook Live. To begin to move from where you are. And transition into another state of being. To move from where you've been. And to shift into another mode of operation. To leave where you've been living, to leave what your mind has been thinking, to leave where your priorities have been, and to move into a new territory, moving into the harvest field. You want revival? That's how it's going to happen. People talk about, oh, the next great revival. Oh, the next great awakening. It won't happen as long as those same people stay in their homes on a Friday night or a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night negating and rejecting the things of the kingdom. Whenever the kingdom doors are open, whenever the church doors are open, whenever a church is having a true revival and they say, you know what? I'm going to just watch it later. You know what? I'm not really worried about that. You know what? I'm just going to catch it on the next go round. As long as people stay there, there will be no revival. There will be no great awakening. But if somebody will say, you know what? I'm done living where I've been living. I'm done thinking about how I've been thinking. And whenever them doors are open, I'm there. And whenever the the, the offering is called, I'm showing. And whenever God prompts me to pray, I'm praying because I want to see a revival in the land. I want to see another great awakening. I want to see the days of John Wesley and Charles Finney and A.A. Allen and Jack Coe and Ben. I want to see it all. And if the church 
can get there, yes. then we will see a revival in the land. And we will see the reaping of the harvest in the harvest field brought into the kingdom. And Jesus says, ask the Lord of the harvest. The owner of the harvest. The master of the harvest. The kurios of the harvest. Ask him to send them. And you never know what might happen. Because Jesus would never tell you or tell me to pray a prayer that he knew wouldn't work. That's right. And when the prayer has gone out, there will be people who are sent out into the harvest field to reap a great harvest. Yes. You never know. He might end up sending you. The kingdom of God in this church, the kingdom of God in this area, the kingdom of God in this locale, in this region, and this county, and this state is not going to move into its next phase if I'm the only one preaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pastor said, you know, how do churches grow? Because people pray. Pastor Santino, you know, how, do, how do churches go from 50 people to 1,000 people to 3,000 people to 5,000 people to 10,000 people? Because people pray. Because people don't keep the word and the kingdom to themselves and use it on a Wednesday night and a Sunday morning and they slap a refrigerator verse on their refrigerator and claim that and, and, and believe that only for themselves and their family. No, they say it's bigger than I am. It's bigger than where I am. It's bigger than what I've been thinking. And so now I take what I know and I take what I've been doing and I bring somebody into the next phase of the kingdom with me and somebody else takes somebody else by the hand and they bring everybody into the next phase of the kingdom. That's how growth happens when people pray. Pray. When people witness, yes. when people glorify God together, that's how ministry grows. That's how revival happens. That's how the kingdom advances in the earth. When you take people and you bring the kingdom to them and you bring them to the kingdom because they're a part of the harvest. Amen. That's right. You want to see this church grow? You want to see the glory of God and the anointing of God that lives in this place, not just stay within four walls with 30 people? It'll happen when you do this. When revival becomes number one. When kingdom growth and kingdom expansion becomes priority in your life. Because when that happens, it's not about you anymore. I have lived my life now. I have relegated my life now to doing one thing. Advancing the kingdom on the earth with the purpose of seeing the glory of the kingdom on the earth. When I wake up in the morning, oh, I have a thousand things on my mind. But you know what plagues me? And you know what haunts me? The kingdom. You know what, what I can't shake? No matter how hard I try, the glory you know what feeds me in the late night hour the anointing 
You know what fills my belly when I'm spiritually hungry? You know what saturates my thirst when I'm spiritually thirsty? The kingdom. And if I can just step into a dimension and a paradigm of the kingdom in that moment I'm fed and I'm given drink that quenches me into the next season because there is one thing and I'm done with this that is certain and it sounds just like the old preacher said Everything done on earth will pass. But everything done for Christ will last. We in 2021, on the last Sunday in November, are living in the kingdom of God on the earth. Because Jesus had asked the Lord of the harvest to send workers in the field. And Peter and John, Matthew, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, and all the rest prayed to the Lord of the harvest to send workers. And out of them came a Stephen. And out of them came an Apostle Paul. And out of them came the church fathers like Tertullian and And out of them came a Martin Luther. And out of Martin Luther came a John Wesley and and then a Charles Finney and a Billy Sunday and a Billy Graham. And a Oral Roberts. And yes, a little off now, but a Carlton Pearson. Start looking these people up. They'll change your lives forever. And out of them came a Pastor Danny D'Angelo. And out of him, Mary, came a me, came a Gina. And out of us shall come the next laborers in the field. Because somebody prayed to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the field because they were few. And so I challenge you. I exhort you. I admonish you to start shifting your mind, moving your mind off to what is earthly. Start moving your mind off of what satisfies the flesh. Completing and accomplishing your own will in the earth. Let it go. Because when you do, and when we do, then the kingdom begins to grow in the earth. As we ask the Lord, of the harvest to send workers into the field. Bow your heads. Father, I ask you, we ask you, everybody on Facebook Live asks you, Everyone who will be watching this video later asks you to send workers into the field. To send workers into where they are. To send workers into where people live. To send workers into where people reside. That you might be the focus. That you might be number one. 
and that the harvest might come, be reaped into the kingdom. I ask God that you would send them now. I ask that you would take them out. I ask that you would pluck them out. I ask that you would send them out from where they are into the field. That they would leave the state and the territory and the field of complacency. That they would leave the state and the atmosphere of self-centeredness. That they would leave the arena of thinking that they are more important and what they think about and what they want is more important and understand that there is a field that is waiting that far outweighs and is more important than anything that we can ask or want. That you might be pleased and that the harvest will be reaped in this generation and that they might be brought into the kingdom as the divine sickle of the word goes forth to transform lives and that harvest may they reap another harvest in their lives in the name of Jesus and if and when we do do all of this we will see the kingdom grow as the harvest comes in so I challenge you on this Sunday to become a laborer. I pray God sends you. I pray God plucks you out of where you are. I pray he plucks you out of your mindset. I pray he plucks you out of your mode of operation and transfers you and transports you into the harvest field where you can't help but hold the harvest sickle in your hand and begin to swing it and swing it and swing it and swing it and swing it until you see a harvest come into the field the likes of which you've never dreamed before. Be a witness. Be an ambassador, be an emissary of the kingdom of God in the earth as you become a laborer in the field in the name of Jesus. Stand to your feet, lift your hands. Father, do what I pray. Send them out. Send them out. Send them out. In the name of Jesus. And might they be laborers and co-laborers with you. That they might bring you glory and bring you great pleasure as they bring people that they know into the kingdom. In the name of Jesus. I speak it now. In Jesus mighty name. I speak the activation now. In Jesus mighty name. I thank you for it. In your glorious name. Your mighty name. So go do it. Go be it. Go be a worker in the field and bring the harvest in to the kingdom and watch souls come in because of what you've done. And so now, Father, rest upon your people. Rest among them, I pray. Watch over them, I ask. And may we see you as we work with you. Reside with us and live with us for your glory and for our good in Jesus name and everybody said amen, amen.